Hello, and thank you for choosing Dynomics. In our previous welcome videos, we touched on how to perform a few selected operations. In this video, I'll perform a full interpretation of the example data. Okay, if you uh, have been following along with the welcome guides, you will have already uh, uploaded our log tops and well header databases and created a CPI uh, file where we'll have made a, uh, a few small interpretations. Uh, in this video, I'm going to go through and do a full end-to-end -end interpretation from start uh, through the volumetrics. Um, if you have not yet uh, uploaded these databases and created your project, uh, please go ahead and do that before getting started with this video. Okay, so the first thing we're wanna, going to want to do is go to the setup module. And uh, we do this by using the uh, drop-down menu here. And we'll select setup. <clears throat> and there are a couple of important options on this page. So first of all, uh, we have the curve calculation start and end. This is basically just where we will draw data from. Um, I'm not too interested here in the shallow section, so I'm just going to have my uh, have this start relative to my first formation top, and I'm going to start, uh, let's say, 250 feet above it. And I'm going to draw this all the way to the end of my available data. Um, I also want to uh, set a statistics window. The statistics window uh, is important for when we're doing things like curve normalization work and uh, when we're doing things like bad hole repair. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have my stats window go from 100 feet above my first available formation top to the end of my available data. I'm not going to worry about deviation surveys at this point uh, because we don't really have uh, any well log data in our deviated wells. <clears throat> so now that we have that set, uh, we can save. Okay, so when you first brought your data into your project uh, through the database selection windows, a lot of things happen behind the background. So we automatically, uh, you know, populated your map and your well list, which obviously you saw, but we also did things like alias all your curves using our uh, built-in alias table of around 7,500 curve mnemonics. We also automatically scaled all of your data. Uh, things that were in percent were converted to decimal. Uh, we put everything in a common lithological reference. So if something was logged in limestone versus sandstone versus dolomite units, we converted those all to a common limestone reference. And we also went through and we converted curves uh, from one curve family to, uh, to another. So for example, our density porosities will have been converted back to bulk densities. And that all happened uh, behind the scenes. Also, if you had uh, multiple LAS files for a log run, or for a well, I should say, those have all been composited together to try to give you maximum data coverage. Uh, so, <clears throat> As you go through and you perform your interpretation, I'm just going to go to my clay volume module here for an example. You'll see that we have a list of our zones here and we go from, you know, essentially top to top. Now, if I were to, to not have a formation here, let's say I did not have my teapot uh, top available, it would just go to Lewis to Parkman. Um, however, uh, that, that would be somewhat inconsistent. And it's often desirable in that case to set up petrophysical zones. So to do this, we'll go edit zones and we'll say customize our zones and select initialize from tops. Here we'll have a list of our tops and we'll see that it says for each of these starts at Lewis, ends at top of next zone, starts at teapot, ends at top of next zone. What's a better practice is to have it end at a specified zone. So for the Lewis, for example, I'll say edit, and I will end this at the Parkman and <clears throat> apply changes. And I'll update this for each of my zones, selecting the, uh, the next zone down. Uh, here you can actually see I made an error and I said ends at the Parkman when it should actually end at the uh, teapot. Teapot Parkman uh, Sussex. The Sussex goes to the Shannon. 
The Shannon goes to the Niobrara. The Niobrara goes to the Carlisle. The Carlisle goes to the Frontier. The Frontier goes to the top of the Maori. The Maori goes to the top of the Muddy Formation. The Muddy goes to the Dakota. And the Dakota is our deepest formation. Um, so for this, we can, uh, for example, maybe we want to apply a specified uh, thickness. So in this case, we're going to say you know, fixed thickness. And we're only interested in the top couple of hundred feet of the Dakota. So we're going to say 200. We're going to hit apply. And now we see that we have sp specified tops and bases for each of the zones. We'll hit apply. Okay, if, if uh, we made any changes here, they'll now appear here in our uh, table. <clears throat> so, now that we've done that, we're ready to continue. So, we had already uh, populated the uh, setup with the correct parameters here. And it's really important in Dynamics to think about the workflow in terms of uh, a couple of different pieces. Uh, we have what I would call getting the data interpretation ready, which covers the setup the curve normalization of the bad hole. There's the core part of the interpretation workflow, which goes from clay volumes through volumetrics interpretation. And then there are optional modules such as geomechanics, shear log modeling, uh, and wellbore stability. So the setup has covered the first part of getting our data interpretation ready, where our data has been aliased and put in the correct uh, unit and lithological reference spaces. Now uh, for curve normalization, <clears throat> Here, Dynamics has a number of one-click curve normalization options. Uh, make sure that you are on your key well. It is important that we do the interpretation on the key well because this will uh, affect the interpretation and it will push these parameters to the non-key key well methods. So uh, here, let's say we want to normalize our gamma ray. Uh, we have a few options here, such as uh, simple shift, uh, which will just align curves. We have a two-point scale and a three-point scale, and we also have scale to fixed range. Uh, let's select simple scale for this example. So we select simple scale, and you'll notice nothing happens to our gamma ray, and that's because by default, the simple scale just normalizes all other wells relative to our key well. So if I come here in my well list and I click on another well, what I'll see is that, that well has been shifted. We can see that it's been slightly shifted lower. And we can see that, that we have some shifting going on for each of our wells that are available. These wells have been stretched and squeezed relative to our key well. To get back to our key well, we can just click on the link here in our databases tab. Uh, so the, the quick methods here don't affect our key well. They only affect uh, target wells, normalizing those relative to our key well. If we want to operate on the key well, also we can scale to a fixed range, in which case you can uh, stretch and squeeze your data uh, relative to uh, specific percentile values. And if you want to do this as min-max scaling, you could you know, set this, for example, at the 0th percentile, the 100th percentile, and put in specific values there. Uh, however, we're going to leave this at simple scale. So we're going to be scaling everything relative to our key well. And remember, this is an optional step. So you don't have to normalize if you don't want to. You can also normalize additional curves. Uh, when you're ready to QC this step, what you would do is you would come down here and say File. And let's say we wanted to QC our, our gamma ray. So we could do that by selecting things either like our average gamma ray map and expecting that zone by zone. Or we could look to see how much the normalization uh, has affected our curves by looking at our gamma ray normalization RMS map. So I'm going to select uh, average gamma ray final and we'll go through the uh, the calculating process here and this will pop up here in our wells menu. While that is calculating I'm going to go ahead and continue with the next step of this which will be 
interpreting my bad hole ID and repair. So when I bring bring this up, uh, here it'll start off with uh, just one default property, but we're probably probably interested in setting more criteria. So for example, I'm going to flag bad hole additionally by my caliper rugosity, uh, a max row B criteria, and a D row max criteria. So um, you'll notice here I left off the caliper max, and the reason why here is caliper is very well specific. Uh, so you know, setting a value for one well may not be appropriate for other wells, whereas the rugosity is a bit more uh, universal in terms of its its reply. Um, so let's uh, let's set some values. Once again, this can either be done via dragging and dropping points on our well log plot, or by entering in default uh, values here. So I'm going to make an adjustment here to my display just to make this a bit more uh, obvious. So I'm going to scale this 0 to 0 0.35. I'm also going to scale my D row curve, uh, let's say, from uh, minus 0.1 to 0 0.35 here. OK, that just makes it a bit more obvious. And we're going to set a default value of 0 0.15 for both the rugosity and our D row. We're going to set a value of 2.25 for our row B min and a value of 2.85 for our row B max. Now, of course, this should be based on knowledge of your uh, lithologies here. Um, and then should be customized on a zone by zone basis. And we, we can inspect and see how, how these changes are being represented here and we can uh, we can take a look at what's been labeled as washout here and it looks like our criteria are pretty good um, however what I will say is uh, when we zoom in what what we'll see is that you know we we've missed a few bits here so there's a bit of some edge effect here that needs to be corrected so I recommend uh, clicking on the pad bad hole button which will pad out our uh, washouts. And in some cases, you may wish to blend your uh, washout calculations with the repaired curve as well. This will apply a little bit of extra uh, smoothing to the curve as well. So now we're flagging out washouts in our uh, density. If you also wish to flag those for the neutron, you can, uh, you can select to flag that for the neutron and maybe flag washout in the neutron and do the same for our uh, sonic curves here. And so let's see how we are flagging stuff here in our neutron. Okay, looks like we're only flagging uh, a few few bits, but maybe let's set that uh, slightly, slightly higher. And uh, it looks like we're doing pretty good here on our, uh, on flagging our bad hole in the sonic. Um, but if we wanted to set that maybe a little bit lower, for example, 110, uh, that that may be worth evaluating. I'm, I'm actually going to uh, going to leave that at, at its higher value there. Okay, so once we have done that, we have corrected our uh, bad hole. Now, what's going on behind the scenes there is we are using uh, every combination of multilinear regression model to uh, to evaluate what's the best combination of curves to use to apply that reconstruction. And that's all happening without you having to uh, to set anything behind the scenes. And once again, since we've performed that on our key well and we've set those settings up for the key well, this interpretation has now been propagated through every well in the project. We'll also have noticed that while we were doing that, uh, that we have also updated our, our map here. And we've now calculated, for example, our average gamma ray final for each of these. Um, you would then go through on a zone by zone basis and expect the inspect these and see uh, how it looks. Here, what, what, what I can tell you uh, in general from looking at this is that you know we have a very tight range on the gamma ray. We're going from about a value of uh, 110 to about 130. Uh, so with that tight of a range, um, it tells me that we've probably got a pretty consistent data set, at least through this one zone. You would then want to go through and check that for uh, additional zones. Okay, so now at this point our data should be interpretation ready, and now we're ready to start the core part of the petrophysical workflow. So we'll start off with our clay volume, 
in our previous guides, uh, we had gone through and done a quick look interpretation, but now let's go through and really set this zone by zone. And we're going to start off by setting the neutron density here. So I'm going to make this cross plot a bit bigger. <clears throat> and let's start off with our pre-zone formation. Uh, we actually don't have any data here. Um, so we're going to turn off our pre-zone and turn on the Lewis. The Lewis is a limestone. I think we've got a pretty good interpretation uh, set there. Now we'll interpretate, interpret the Teapot, Parkman, Sussex, Shannon, Carlisle, Frontier, Maori, Dakota, and our post zone um, we'll, we'll leave off for now. These are all predominantly sandstone uh, units. <clears throat> so what we'd like to do is we'd like to go set these. And what we want to do is adjust these uh, so that we're on our sandstone uh, matrix point. We want our clay point to essentially come here and bound the bottom part of the trend of this data. And we want the top part here to fall on a high porosity value on our sandstone trend line. So now that we've got that set, let's once again uh, go in and check our Niobrara and our Maori formations. I think we've got a pretty good interpretation already for those. And we're going to end up with our post zone here. And our post zone is a bit of a mixed uh, lithology system. We have some limestones and dolomites and sandstones. Uh, I'm not necessarily too concerned about this because it's not really a zone of interest uh, for me. But um, I am going to leave this set on a limestone reservoir. And I will drop the, uh, the, the clay endpoint uh, farther out there. So now once I've interpreted you know, my, uh, my neutron density zone by zone, I'm going to go through and set the gamma ray uh, values. And we're going to do this by dragging and dropping the endpoints here on, the, uh, on our well log plot. <clears throat> and I'm going to start up here in the uh, Lewis formation. Now you notice the neutron density doesn't continue all the way up, so I'm really performing my calibration here on the... Uh, lower part of this. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to move the clean line over until I, until I get good alignment. And you know, I'm going to do this, something similar here for my pre-zone here. So I'm going to try and set it to a, a similar value. Okay, and we'll repeat this on a zone by zone uh, basis here. So let's, let's adjust this. And what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to get a good match between my clay volume from gamma ray and my clay volume uh, from neutron density. Now we're not going to get perfect alignment, but our goal is to get it uh, fairly close so that these roughly uh, overlie one another. Okay. Uh, looks like we've got pretty good alignment already here, but I'm actually going to uh, adjust these values a bit to try and get them to match my previous zone. Okay, uh, once again, let's put a small little adjustment onto these. <clears throat> okay, for our Niobrara, let's see. It's, uh, it's a bit trickier here in the organic shells, uh, trying to use a, a gamma ray. Um, you can always turn the gamma ray off if you would like. Okay, and uh, just as we're as we're going through here, now you'll know here, notice here in the frontier formation, we have some very uh, high gamma ray intervals. Um, we're just not going to get a match on those, um, regardless of how we set the parameters. So it's more about trying to match the package as a whole. Um, once again, the Maori is an organic shell, um, so we're going to have quite high gamma ray values through there. And then we'll need to set the values here for our uh, Dakota formation. So let's let's adjust these just a bit here. <clears throat> okay, and now we have a fairly acceptable interpretation of the V clay, both from neutron density and gamma ray. And here are the values 
that we are using uh, for those parameters if you want to match what, what, what we have. Okay, so that's performing our clay volume interpretation. And we are taking the minimum of either the V-clay from gamma ray or the V-clay from neutron density. And that's set here by default. And that's what's creating our uh, V-clay curve. So now we'll move on to our TOC analysis. Uh, there are a couple of zones here where we're concerned about the TOC. That would be in the Maori and the Niobrara formation because those are our, are our organic shells. So uh, we have several methods here that we can use for uh, calculating uh, TOC. We have the PASI overlay methods, modified PASI, uh, as well as uh, the Schmoker, Wernick, and Faust methods. Um, <clears throat> so let's get started in setting those. And we're going to start off with uh, some of our PASI overlay methods here. So PASI, uh, sonic, density, and neutron. The first step here is to set the value of your resistivity uh, in an inorganic shell. And, uh, you know, we can, we can think about this by, for example, looking at a cross plot of something like um, our RT versus our clay. And we can see how, how at high V clay values, uh, we have, you know, those resistivity values. Right now, I'm only looking at it for the post zone formation. If we say all formations, what we can really see is that for several of these, we'll have a value around two, three, about four ohms, which is just by coincidence where we happen to be with our default values. Uh, for our baseline values here, once again, we need to set the value to what it should be in a uh, inorganic shell. In this case, uh, we'll, we'll use a value of around 90 here. And, uh, that, that may be a little bit on the high side, actually looking at it. it. looks like a value of around 85 would be more appropriate. And what we're really trying to do here is we're just trying to set uh, this parameter line. So when we're in inorganic shell, uh, you know, we, we have that value calibrated. Now we'll do the same thing for density. Uh, looks like a value of around you know, maybe 2.5. 2.55 may be a good good place to start our interpretation. Um, uh, maybe that could go a little bit a little bit higher there. Yep, so we'll try a value of around 2.6. And then for neutron, once again, we'll set a similar value here. Um, and what, what we'll notice is we're setting it here in the inorganic shells, and we should see it highlighted here in the organic shells where we do see some... Uh, overlap in the, the values. Um, we'll want to do a similar thing here for our uh, modified PASI, um, where we need to set our resistivity of the bound water. And here, what we're wanting to do is we're going to set it so when we're in an inorganic shell, we don't see uh, any shading available, or at least no, none of the red shading. But we do want to see um, you know the curves coming very close to overlying one another. And then we can also, uh, sorry, wrong drop down menu. We can also set this uh, for Vernick as well and set a value of, let's say, uh, 2.6 to see how that affects, affects things. And that was the same value that we set for our uh, clay density over here. Okay, and then we can choose on the final method that we want. And I'm just going to choose uh, modified PASI. Um, and we see that in general we have a pretty good, pretty good match between things like our uh, TOC from Faust as well as our modified PASI. We see good agreement between the uh, neutron and uh, sonic base values as well. Um, and you can mix and match which value you'd like to take on a zone by zone basis. Um, however, I'm just running the same one for each each value. Now you'll notice here one of the things that we did not do is we did not uh, customize the uh, the VRE value. Um, if you if you knew this, you would certainly put this in. And what would be even better is we could select this gear icon here, and let's say we had a map of our maturity from like some something like uh, imported core data. We could choose to use a map here as well. Um, so we could we could select a grid file and have that populate our parameters for us, uh, which is quite useful for things like uh, vitronite reflectance, which varies spatially. Okay, so once we have our TOC analysis done, now we're going to do mineral inversion. 
Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with mineral inversion, it is a very powerful uh, technique for calculating uh, both the the mineralogy and more importantly the grain density and doing so will give us a uh, better uh, understanding of porosity and you know it will give us that better calculation of porosity because then we won't be setting the grain density as a parameter it'll be something that is calculated from the data itself uh, so what we have to do in a mineral inversion is we have to select the minerals that we'd like to use and the curves that we would like to use. Um, and in general, you want to select as few of minerals as possible while still representing the rock. Um, and so let's, let's zoom out a little bit here. Okay. So here's our, here's our well logs and, uh, <clears throat> And for most of these intervals, we don't have any dolomite or pyrite. Uh, so I'm going to turn those off by default. Uh, this area is uh, oily across most of the formations. So we're going to leave oil as our primary hydrocarbon fluid. Um, however, uh, in zones such as the uh, Niobrara, uh, we do have some pyrite here um, because that's associated with our organics. Same is true for the Maori, where we also have a little bit of pyrite uh, in the formation. Once again, associated with those organics. And then in the post zone, uh, we actually happen to have some dolomites in there. So we're going to turn dolomite back on in those formations. Okay, so as we've done that, everything has updated itself uh, as is. And and we want to go through now and set some default values to try and get better matches. So uh, in case you're not familiar with inversion, uh, the uh, black line is our actual data here. The red line is our predicted values from what comes out of the inversion. And the yellow represents the uh, uncertainty in those curves. So what you'll notice is that we have... Uh, we have in some cases very good matches like we would for our PE curve and our density. Our neutrons an okay match, but in this case our sonic uh, is, is really, really poorly fit. Um, so we need to try and understand uh, why and correct that. So once again, we'll go back to our default here. So we want to set this for our default. And what you'll, what you'll notice when you look at this is a lot of these properties are very well known and there's very little uh, room in your interpretation to change things up. Uh, however, the clay volume is an excellent area where you can adjust these properties. And uh, we can use some cross plots to help us out with these. So for example, if we look at a, a sonic clay cross plot, what, what we can see is that the sonic value, even at very high clay volumes, uh, ever gets ab never gets above really 100 ohms anywhere or not, not, sorry, not ohms, 100 microsecond per feet anywhere. So we can adjust that. Um, so let's say we set that at 100. And when we do that, we see the sonic curve uh, adjust itself. Now we are actually still uh, have quite a bit of misfit in here. And when we look out, remember at our pure clay in members, um, it looks like we're, we're actually quite low here. So we can actually probably lower this down to a, a value of around 90 here and now we really start to get a good match in our sonic uh, so we're, we're really falling within uh, the the error bars there and um, <clears throat> you know we can you know we, we've got a good match we do have a little bit of misfit down here in our post zone uh, you know this is some old old sediments very highly compacted so maybe in our post zone, we could even set that a little bit lower. So I'm going to set that to a value of 85. Now that custom value here only affects the post zone. Now I'm going to go back to our default values. And uh, let's, let's take a look here. You know, are there any other curves that we need to, that we need to adjust in this case? It looks like in the neutron, uh, we do have a couple of areas, specifically the higher, higher clay areas where our neutron is a little low. Uh, we could make a similar plot to this for neutron, um, or we could look at the neutron density cross plot. I'm going to put a value of around 0.45 in there. And now we can see in those high clay areas, we're getting a good match and we've maintained our goodness of fit in the low clay areas. Um, we can use conductivity uh, if we would like. Um, conductivity is mainly affected by the fluids and we have that turned uh, off by default, but if you want to 
select fit for that, um, you'll see that all of a sudden we get a much better fit on our conductivity because now we're actually using that in the inversion. Uh, by default, we have uh, very loose constraints on the conductivity. We have the confidence interval set at 500, which is uh, quite high. Um, you can certainly uh, tighten that up if you would like. We'll put that at a value of, let's say, 250. And now you can see that we, we get an even better fit here on our uh, conductivity. Um, we, we should... Uh, set our conductivity of our clay. So once again, if we if we look at our RT clay, um, <clears throat> you know if our if our uh, the conductivity of our clay is let's say around value of around four, uh, that corresponds to a value of around 250 for conductivity, uh, which is what is in there by default, which is probably why we're getting a pretty reasonable match. So now we have uh, updated this uh, for our mineral inversion. And so now we can move on to the porosity. What we'll need to do is we'll need to tell our porosity interpretation that we want to use the results from the mineral inversion. And we have two options here. We've got the mineral solver porosity and the strict version of it. The strict uses an exact sum of the fluids, while the uh, non-strict mode just uses the grain density. Uh, for this in interpretation, I'm just going to take the grain density. And uh, we have a few options here that we can set. So we can set our own row fluid. Um, I'm going to set a 1.04 here. And I'm going to adjust my clay porosity to a value of 0 0.1. And as we do that, we see the results are updated. And now we have our porosities calculated. And now m most of the work for that, of course, was done in our mineral inversion. And we're taking advantage of that here. And now we'll move on to our water saturation interpretations. In the water satu saturation, we have several methods that are available to us. Things like Archie, Siemendu, Modified Siemendu, Indonesian Dual Water, and Waxman Schmitz. Uh, I personally like to use a Archie total porosity as a good starting point. <clears throat> um, and and see, see what that results in. And of course, we can bring up <coughs> excuse me, a picket plot here. To evaluate uh, our parameters and I always find it useful to filter down our picket plot and to filter this we use an expression here I like to filter it to have our volume of clay let's say less than or equal to about 40% uh, and I like to have our uh, effective porosity let's say greater than or equal to about 0.3% so around sorry around 3% so that cleans up this plot a little bit. And um, here, of course, you'd like to bring in your, your fluids data. Uh, you know, Also make sure that you set your surface temperature. So in this area, that's about 60, and our geothermal gradient's about 1.1. Uh, this geothermal gradient is also an excellent place where you could bring in uh, spatial data, such as grids that you may have from uh, other studies that you've done. And of course, we can you know set things like our m value and our n value if we want to. <clears throat> and we, we should really go through and do this interpretation on a zone by zone basis and see how that is is holding up. But before we do that, I just want to catch the main part of the trend, and then we can think about setting some of the uh, some of the other parameters. So now let's start looking at that zone by zone. So let's say we want to look at the uh, teapot. Okay, we see we have a very consistent trend here where it's sub parallel to our 100% water trend similar for the Parkman the Sussex and the Shannon so we're going to turn those off take a look at it for the Carlisle the Frontier and the Muddy together once again we see a, a pretty convincing wet trend here in our data how about our Niobrara and our Maori Okay, those organic shells are kind of doing what we expect, where they have uh, lower saturations. And then finally, we can look at the Dakota and our post zone. I think we have a pretty good uh, fit there to our data. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, let me just uh, turn, a, turn a formation there back on. Uh, okay, so w once we have this, let's say, um, I, I think we can feel okay about this uh, saturation. Um, Let's zoom in and let's look at something like the Niobrara 
here or the um, or the Maori formation. These are a couple of the organic shales. And you know, here we see that we do have you know uh, lower lower saturations. And if we look at something like our our sandstones up here in the uh, Parkman and the teapot, okay, here we can see that we do have you know uh, some resistivity developing, you know, where we have lower gamma ray and we have a bit better porosity, and we can see this is reflected in our saturations. And if we want to change the shading in here, we can just go modify our fill. And let's say, let's have that fill go from 65% uh, out to our uh, clay curve. And we can see that we get a, a bit more highlighting on, on where we may have some potential uh, net pay in this well. Okay, so now we're ready to do our cutoffs interpretation. Okay, we had previously worked on this a little bit. Um, you know what I would say from looking at this, it looks like, you know, our... Uh, the default values that we'd used earlier are way too high. So let's change that to around, uh, you know, 35% uh, clay volume. Um, and we see this really cleans up the tracks here. So we, now we can see that, you know, this sand at the top of the teapot is really being highlighted. Um, same thing for the sand at the top of the Parkman. Uh, once again, that's being highlighted. Now maybe we need to uh, really adjust this and try and tune that in. Um, you know, is 35 the right value? You know, should it be 38? Should it be 40? Um, really depends on <clears throat> on how you're setting this. But but I will say in this example, it is uh, it's quite sensitive uh, to those cutoffs. So we're gonna we're gonna leave that um, you know around. Uh, sorry, at around 35%. Um, and we, we are leaving that a bit higher for the uh, Niobrara and the Maori. These are our organic shells. Um, and in many cases, you know, our completion engineers will tell us that, that we can actually uh, complete these in, uh, you know, in significantly higher clay volume rocks. And so in those cases, we like to uh, think about that. For our net res, 6% uh, effective porosity, uh, that may be right for some of the sand, for some of the intervals, maybe not for others. Um, <clears throat> so may, maybe let's set that down around 5% here. And then for our organic shells, let's say we want to use different criteria here. Let's actually say we'd rather set that to be our total uh, porosity. So let's change that phi E to phi T. And then for our saturation, let's say we're interested in anything that has less than 65% saturation there. And now we have uh, now we have our gross reservoir, net reservoir, net pay defined. Um, one final step that's useful is to screen out uh, any intervals that are less than a certain thickness. By default, we have that as two feet. Um, you know, we, we can increase that, we can decrease it, and what you'll see is it gets rid of any, uh, you know, it gets rid of any of these very thin intervals. So that, that's really kind of personal style, um, and once again, you should adjust that a little bit. And finally, there's an option here called Map Partial Zones. Uh, for Map Partial Zones, uh, what this means is if we don't have data over the entire interval, <clears throat> should we still uh, map it? Um, in most cases, I opt against mapping partial zones. And the reason why is if you were missing part of the teapot formation, you're not really getting an apples to apples comparison if you're missing half the data in one zone, but not another. And therefore I'm saying, unless we have complete data coverage, let's not uh, map it. So for example, the Lewis formation in this well would not be mapped because we don't have uh, complete data coverage for uh, things like our saturation curves and our porosity curves. Okay, so now that we've done that, uh, maybe we're ready now to start looking at some of our maps. Um, and I'm just going to start off here by hitting the uh, refresh button here beside the map. And once again, this will pop open our <clears throat> our jobs menu, where it'll say initializing and then running. Um, it'll take around two minutes uh, for this to run. Um, and while that's, while that's running, we're gonna look at a couple of the other options that are available to us. So, um, you know, 
we do have cross sections uh, built in here to Dynomics. And so if we click on the cross sections tab, you'll see that we get a cross section that marches back and forth across the map. And uh, this is this was automatically drawn for us and we'll need to, we can set the template here using this uh, template drop down menu. Uh, we can choose to flatten that on a formation and we could also come in here and we could modify our formations, add new tops, uh, pick tops, etc. Um, I'm not gonna do that right now because we're in the middle of doing this calculation and I don't wanna change my stratigraphy at the moment because that would, uh, of course, you know, change the results from the interpretation. Um, but I do wanna show you a few options here. So uh, it may not be very useful for you to come in and, <clears throat> and look at all the wells at once. Perhaps you only wanna look at the wells you're interested in. So what we'll do is we will, uh, we will create a, our own custom cross sections. And to do that, uh, we'll click on the cross sections tab here and we'll need to select a, uh, a cross sections database. Now we don't have one, so we're gonna click create new and we're gonna call this cross section points and we hit okay. And now what we can do is we can create a new cross section. So we're gonna say new and, uh, and let's give this a name. We're gonna call this, uh, for example, um, East West uh, Cross Section One. Okay, and now that we have that, we're ready to populate it here. <clears throat> and what, what we'll do is just right click and we're gonna say Capture East West Cross Section One. And we're going to go click, click, click. And as we're clicking through here, You'll notice the cross section is populating itself. And then we right click and say cancel capture. And you'll see this cross section has drawn itself as we've gone through here. If we wanted to uh, reorder the curves, we could click here and we could drag and drop those up and down. We could also remove curves by clicking on the X. Okay, and if we wanna create a new cross section, let's say we wanna create a north south cross section now, um, we can say new. And let's give, once again, give this a name. So we're gonna call it Northwest uh, Cross Section One. Okay. And we're, once again, we'll right click, capture North South One, and we'll select a handful of wells here that are just going North South through our uh, field. Right click and say cancel, cancel capture. Once again, you'll notice this cross section has uh, drawn itself and you know we can see that we have a, a number of wells on here and once again we come in and modify tops pick tops etc uh, now you notice it's only showing my active cross section right now because that's what my options are active all or none so i'm going to say all and now you can see our other cross section here and i can make that active either by clicking on it here or by selecting it in the drop down menu where we now have east west and north south available to us and you can build out as many cross sections as you'd want using this methodology okay so that's how we use the cross section we see in the meantime that our map here has uh, finished okay and so now what we've done is we've not just calculated the average gamma ray final for the niobrara we've actually calculated every map for every zone so we can go through and we can do this QC. So, <clears throat> you know, we can come come in here and we can look at the average gamma ray final for the Parkman formation. And we can see, you know, what's what's going on, on here. Uh, we can look at it for the Shannon. Um, you know, we can do this expect inspection zone by zone looking for uh, looking for bad values or values that have been been busted. If we want to see how much we have normalized curves by, so if we look at our gamma ray norm RMS for the Shannon, uh, we can see that, you know, now the contour interval here is quite small. Looks like contour interval of two, but curves have been moved between being shifted two units lower to about 24 units higher here. Um, so, you know, we, we could come in and we could look at this uh, well by well and decide if we wanted to apply a different method. Um, so if we look at our uh, curve normalization here, we can see, you know, what's been, what, how are, how are the curves affected? In this case, they've been shifted, uh, you know, substantially higher across most of our interval. Uh, and we could come in and, and once again, um, 
you know, it's not just this particular property, it, it's any property. So we could also look at things like, you know, our average neutron across a formation, our average density, etc. And what we do is we'd repeat this process, uh, you know, well, well by well, um, or not well by well, but zone by zone, property by property. So for example, if we wanted to QC our grain density, um, we can pull up our average grain density here, and let's say we're interested in it for our Niobrara formation. <clears throat> and it looks like there's quite a, you know, quite a bit going on in this map, but that's actually because the contour interval is quite small. Remember, if we want to customize our contour intervals, we can we can customize those to a much smaller, uh, more appropriate range here. So here I'm going from 2.65 to 2.85 with a contour interval of two grams per cc and now we can see this map uh, is is much uh, better better behaved you know we have a much smaller data range um, that's available or, or that's being displayed uh, and so that is that is how you do the QC um, that's also you know for things you're interested in as results so for example if we were interested in our hydrocarbon pore volume um, you know, here we'll just go back with our auto contouring. Uh, you know, we can we can look and see how you know do the results you know make sense? Do the ranges make sense? And do we want to make that uh, <clears throat> you know something that's a bit more customized? And let's say we want to go from a value of let's say zero to twenty and put that in increments of two. You know, now we can see how this map uh, starts to starts to look. <clears throat> okay, so that is an end-to-end -end interpretation on the petrophysics. Uh, now what you may want to do is you may actually want to make this into a map, and so we are going to in include that as part of this as well. So let's say we wanted to have something with a bit more of a sophisticated display. So uh, we could go File, and we could go New Map, and we can call this Welcome Project.Map. We're going to hit okay here and this brings up a blank blank map now these maps are meant to be ones that are more for display purposes so have a few more options um, and we're going to start off with some with our well markers here and we'll just choose our welcome project uh, well headers and we can say add and we can see that it populates our map and we can zoom into it here now what would probably be useful is if we had some references like our uh, like our shape files. So we can bring those in. So I'm going to go file and I'm going to say uh, upload shapes. <clears throat> and we can choose our file here and we're going to take uh, shape files and we're going to say Wyoming uh, counties does shape to get started. And, uh, and we're going to actually choose a projection file to go with it. So we're going to choose our counties, open, hit OK. Uh, we're going to upload additional shape files. So upload, uh, upload shapes, choose file. We're also going to upload some townships. And uh, I'm going to call this townships. And we're going to choose a projection file. And we're going to choose townships here. Open and OK. And uh, you'll notice here I actually forgot to uh, forgot to give this a name, so I'm going to uh, rename it here, and I'm going to call this uh, counties here. And I actually didn't create that in the same file, so I can just drag and drop those up into the same folder. So now, if I want to display those shape files, I can select counties. And I'm going to give this a width of two and hit add. And then I'm going to select my shape file, the townships, give that a width of one. And I'm going to color this a uh, dark gray color and hit add. And now it'll draw our townships on here. Uh, let's say we wanted to, we had some acreage in this area that we wanted to bring in. Uh, once again, we bring in our acreage as uh, shape files. So right click, uh, upload upload uh, shapes and I'm going to call this my acreage when I say choose file I'm going to choose the associated shape file 
and uh, I will also choose the associated projection file and I'm going to hit OK here. That will upload, run, and then it'll be available to us. <clears throat> and I'm going to select uh, the shape file. I'm going to choose my acreage and uh, I'm going to have, a, have an a outline of one, but I want to give this a fill as well. So I'm going to fill this with a uh, yellowish color here. I'm going to say add. And I'm going to move this up to the very top to make that make that visible. Okay, and I'm actually not seeing where that where that acreage is, so we may have uh, actually may may be in the wrong place here. Um, let's just zoom in a little bit here. Uh, it could also be that it's a very very small area. Once again, let's just take a look. Uh, my acreage dot shape. Okay, we'll we'll investigate that uh, further. Okay, and now we probably want to add our petrophysical property map uh, in here. So to do that, what we'll do is once, once again click the uh, plus button here, and we will this time choose property. We'll choose our CPI file. We'll choose the property that we want to run. In this case, we're going to display uh, hydrocarbon pore volume. So HCPV summary. We're going to do this for the Niobrara zone. Uh, we want to use this uh, turbo property map in this example. And uh, we're going to hit, oops, thought I had selected that. I guess not. And we're going to hit uh, add. <clears throat> and this is pulling that map from the petrophysics file here. Oh, looks like I forgot to select the property here. Apply. There we go. Now we have that property available to us uh, as, as well as the wells here on our map and some culture such as the county boundaries and the uh, and the township and range. Okay, once again, remember to save that as well as saving your uh, petrophysics project. Um, also, you know, there are a few more things we can do as part of this interpretation. So, uh, you know, you'll notice we have some deviated wells in here. Maybe we want to understand those uh, deviations a bit better. Um, so we, we do have some available 3D views. So I'm going to uh, split our window here and I'm going to drag this 3D view over here. Now this 3D view is uh, currently blank uh, at the moment. Um, and what I'm going to do, I'm just going to start off by adding some well markers. So I'm going to add our, our well header database here and I'm going to click add. Um, now this doesn't do us, uh, do us much good. Um, because, you know, these well headers, uh, they're just points in space. What we need to have are our deviation files. So to get those in, we're going to right click. We're going to say upload. And deviation files come in as, as points. We're going to choose file. And we are going to get our deviation data. And this is in form of API, measure depth, inclination, and azimuth. And so I'm going to call this uh, deviation data hit OK. And to process that, to get it into, uh, into the right format to display in the 3D window, we're going to create a new flow. We're going to say File, New Flow. We're going to call this Process Deviations. And we'll say New Points Input. We're going to say New uh, deviations to XYZ and finally we're going to say uh, points output. I'm going to add that in. Points input we're going to select our um, deviation data and then we're going to select our columns here for inclination and azimuth and then finally we have our points output 
and we're going to call this processed deviations save and hit the run button here and this will process those deviations so we can then view them in 3d space <clears throat> okay that's finished we can come back here to our map and now we can say let's add some well bores and we'll select the well headers and our recently processed deviations and we'll hit add now one thing we'll notice here is that the uh, deviations all seem to be lining up in one uh, place and that's because our map right now is in lat long as opposed to XYZ so that's not really what we want so what we'll do is we'll come back to this map here in a minute I'm just gonna turn these layers off what we need to do is we need to set a projection for our for our project so once again I'm gonna move these folders up here into our project folder and I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna say edit projection I'm gonna say OK I'm gonna say from projection file and then I'm gonna choose uh, the correct projection here I'm gonna say open we can preview that if we want and then we'll save that so now we have saved our uh, projection if we come back over here to our map and let's save and we'll do a uh, now we'll, we'll look at our options here okay there's our our uh, our well markers and let's go ahead and do a quick refresh Okay, so what we need to do now is we need to, um, you know, move our uh, move our view into the right spot. And here now you can see that we have uh, a number of wells <clears throat> that are displayed in our 3D view, including some horizontal wells. And the way we can control the camera in the center point here is is you know we can we can move it in 3D space. You know, we can zoom in here, but we can also specifically uh, move the center of where our camera is here. So if I want to just look at look at that those those wells, um, I could I could do that. I could come here and I could grab the view that we're looking from, and uh, and we can you know zoom in specifically to those wells, and we can see here we have a pad that's been uh, that's been drilled out and so that is how we can take this and we can view it in 3d space as well okay so now we have gone through and we have done a full interpretation of the petrophysics uh, that we did here in our petrophysical interpretation file where we went through we set a key well <coughs> we got our data interpretation ready and then we marched through and uh, and in all the way through the uh, volumetrics evaluation or through our cutoffs here uh, we then went through and we uh, decided to make a display map where we imported uh, our shape files we added those to our map we added a, our petrophysical results to the map and then we even brought in some deviation data and uh, as well as um, process that to put it in XYZ space and built a 3D display. All right, I hope that was useful to you. And uh, as always, if you need any help, you can contact us uh, at support at Thank you.